If I wanted to become a Sufi, where would I start? What would be my first step? Well, your first step would probably be to ask me or Atum or any one of the leaders if they would like to give you an initiation. <coughs> mm -hmm. And then we would probably give you a mantra to work with. Mm -hmm. And we'd follow you that up. Now we'd give you some breathing practices too. Um, it, you know, uh, just even just slowing down the breath uh, does um, have an effect on altering um, the setting of consciousness. And uh, then we'd see how you're faring and probably change the practices. And then uh, we'd probably give you more advanced practices. And then at uh, some time, if you uh, wish to uh, go really more deeply into it, we might say, well, we think that perhaps you are ready for a retreat if you um, are able to get away for a few days. And the benefits of all of these things would do what for me? Well, uh, I ha must say I, I'm very aware of the importance of that question. I'm, uh, my, my whole uh, concern is uh, what does this do to people? And I uh, would not be doing what I am doing if it weren't for the fact that it's meant as much as it has meant to me, mm. and if it were not for the fact that I've seen people blossom out uh, in a way that is quite incredible. Mm. Now, I'd like to ask you that uh, there are certain practices which the disciple follows by mm. taking the initiation from a Sufi master and uh, yes. practicing the meditation and uh, other exercises. Now, other than that, uh, is there any way he can practice day-to-day, -day, daily? Not that his religious practice is restricted only to sitting inside the home or sitting oh, yes. across oh, yes, yes, of course. We give you, if I, we give you a mantra, for example, it means that you would be not required, but requested or advised, let us say, to repeat this word, for example, every morning, a uh, number of times which uh, we could uh, define according to the case, prescribe according to the case. It might be even just very short, it might be just 33 times, it could be 101 times and so on. And the breathing practices, so these are practices that would be done every day. Now, uh, amongst the practices, I would say one of the, the ones that delights me the most is the practices with light. I'm sorry? With light. Practices mm. with light, oh. And um, those are... Um, you know, for example, when you receive initiation in the Sufi order, you are told um, that you may find the path that will lead you towards the fulfillment of your life's purpose, illumination. Now, that word illumination is um, it's not always clear what one means by it, but uh, I think that one aspect of the word illumination means that one has awakened and has become very aware and uh, very radiant and... Uh, uh, so, uh, in some way, it is connected with um, light, with um, uh, working with light. Uh, some people have just have a lot of light and bring light wherever they go, and other people have a lot of gloom and bring mm. gloom wherever they go. <coughs> and I think most people would like to belong to the first category. Mm. Now, the f it's very interesting now, uh, you see, in the old days when I used to teach uh, meditations like uh, imagining light, for example, Imagining you looking at light, or imagining that you're you're surrounded with light, people will say, "Well, aren't you hallucinating?" <laughs> Nowadays, of course, uh, we know that you can uh, one can measure the amount of photons that are radiated by a body, mm. and what is much more interesting, uh, it is able one is able to ascertain that if one uh, concentrates on light intensely, uh, one radiates more light, and this has been measured in laboratories, for example. Um, Dr. Motayama in Tokyo has measured the amount of photons radiated by a person and then they, he asked them to start w meditating on light and then uh, the <coughs> amount of light that is emitted is increased tremendously. So you, you have a proof, you, <coughs> you ascertain it. Is it possible that uh, the religious practices or the practices for enlightenment is not limited to only certain hours of the day but uh, to well, retain it for 24 yeah. hours, I yeah. mean, even while walking on the street and yes. talking to one's yes. neighbors. Well, you just, uh, you're just saying exactly what I meant to say as a, after, uh, as a second um, stage in what we we're talking about. You see, <coughs> of course, according to the Sufis, of course, the, 
one reaches a point when one does not have to retire for a few a half an hour or so to meditate in one's room, but one is continually in a state of meditation. Now, what that means exactly, uh, I'm, I've been trying more and more to be quite clear about what that means, <coughs> and, and of course to practice it myself. Now, according to Sufis, what it would mean is, for example, you're walking in the streets of New York, <coughs> and you're conscious that you are the glance, the divine glance looking into the streets of New York, instead of thinking that you are looking into the streets of New York. You are the one looking out. Uh, out you, here. let's say, you're just your personal glance, mm -hmm. you see. You get into a sort of cosmic consciousness instead of just thinking of yourself as the being that you think you are, you see. Mm -hmm. Now that would be a very clear case of meditation, instead of the only, most people walk in the streets of New York just think that they're walking in the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, Einstein, who was walking in the streets of New York, pushing a pram. And um, while he was pushing a pram, he thought to himself, look at you, walking in the streets of New York, pushing a pram. But most people are walking in the streets of New York, pushing a pram, but can't see themselves looking, in, uh, looking at themselves, uh, pushing a pram in New York, you see. So it's like uh, what one, in psychology, one calls it um, <coughs> self-transcendence. The ability to look at yourself objectively, at least what you thought you were objectively, mm. instead of assuming that you are what you think you are. That would be like a way of meditating in action. You don't have to, for that, you don't have to retire in, your, in a cell. How does a Sufi commune with God? Is there a specific, um, specific way? To what? To commune with God. I mean, is it in a meditation? <coughs> is it a prayer? Well, you see, there are moments, as I say, I myself take maybe an exaggerated view uh, of God not as a being other than us, you see. So the word commune uh, is uh, a way of looking at things when we think of God as other than ourselves when we use the word commune. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, uh, yes, remember this. Um, let's say, in the ordinary experience, there is, we assume that we are the observer and we are observing something other than ourselves. Now, there's something deeper than the ordinary experience, which, as a matter of fact, St. Francis talked about when he said, that which is seen is that which sees. And so, instead of, it's no more subject-object, but it's all one. one. And therefore, I think that one can use the word communion instead of experience there. And I think that that is what we mean by mysticism. For example, St. Fra well, Francis was, uh, you know, just one example of what I'm, but many Sufis, do exactly, did exactly what St. Francis was doing, walking in the forest. Now, uh, most people walking in the forest just see the branches of the trees or the um, surface of the trees or the leaves of the trees. And he was experiencing what it's like to be a tree, getting into the consciousness of the trees. So that's much more deep, uh, much deeper than experience, you see. And that's what I mean by the experience of God. It's like discovering really more than just a reality, one could say even a presence behind the way things appear at the surface. And what happens then is that, uh, again, to quote the Sufis, one, one sees, one grasps that which transpires behi behind that which appears. It's very important to remember those words, that which transpires behind that which appears. So that normally most people are experiencing that which appears. And if one is really meditating in everyday life, one is grasping that which transpires behind that which appears. Now, there's a practice that we do for, uh, in order to develop this with a glance. That is, for example, uh, with your closed eyes, you uh, think that your glance is um, like the headlamps of a car, projecting light upon all things. And then, uh, and uh, then naturally your glance is going to be set at infinity. Now, if you open your eyes, the objects or the people in the room will force your glance into focus to s so that you're able to see their physical bodies. Now, if you keep your glance set at infinity and refuse to let your glance be forced into focus by the objects in the room, then you begin to discover the eternal face behind the physical face of people. And that eternal face is so beautiful that you are, uh, you're just 
full of delight and you're carried into a state of ecstasy. And that's why the dervish is, is always in a state of ecstasy, because one is seeing beauty where other people can't see it. And then you begin to realize that behind this, I'm sorry, but we've made it rather a cesspool of this beautiful green planet, but uh, you realize that behind all of this, mm. there's such splendor that it's quite unbelievable. And when you see that, then of course you're so moved. <clears throat> I was reading your book, <coughs> The Call of the Dervish. Call of the Dervish, yes. And uh, there you mentioned that uh, Sufism is not actually a religion. No. It's a certain basic fundamental, it's a philosophy with an esoteric discipline to reach communion yes. with the uh, supreme power. It's a good word. Yeah. And which uh, has been taught by many religions and uh, many philosophies. Now, can you please tell us that uh, how a man who is a Sufi relates himself or treats the people who follows other religions or different religions and philosophies? Uh, yes. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, as I said, Sufi is not, not, not a religion, so one can be initiated into the Sufi order, for example, and belong to any religion one wishes. And uh, what is more, we would we would not like... Excuse uh, me for interrupting. That's interesting. You said that one can be a Sufi, at the same time he can be in any other religion. Of course. He can be a Christian or he can yes, be a Hindu. Yes, of course. Most of our members are Christians, a lot of Jews, and there are some Muslims, and perhaps there are some Hindus and Sikhs. But, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we would not like for um, our very universal approach to take people away from their roots, let's say. Mm. And so we even encourage people to, as long as they feel comfortable in their uh, religion, to stay in their religion, but perhaps understand it more deeply. And uh, many people have said that you've helped me to understand my religion better. Than so it's really more of an attitude. It's an attitude, yes, really. really a, yes, a, yes, a, yes, way yes, of, yes. a way of being, yes. as opposed to believing yes. in something. Yes. I see. You know, you use the word being a Sufi. Um, now, most Sufis would never claim to be a Sufi. Um, it's, um, Why is that? One could say I've been initiated in the Sufi order. But uh, the, I'm afraid of that label, you see. I'm a Sufi. Are you a Sufi? You know, I mean, it's not like a group or a... Uh, well, it's like true that being initiated, uh, well, one is, uh, I suppose one, is, one could say that one is a member of member the of Sufi a... order, but um, I like to make it as lax as possible, not to make uh, too much of a sect out mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, but the, med the meditation is very much a part of it, isn't it? Yes. Now, that for me, that's the real, that's, that's the real thing. That's, that's where it's at. It's something that... Um, I find very difficult, and I wondered if you could uh, tell people in general what the easiest way to try and meditate. Yes, well, what I understand by meditation is um, modulating consciousness beyond its ordinary um, setting. Uh, let's say consciousness in a human being acts rather like a lens. <clears throat> Uh, the lens of camera, for example, limits the uh, richness of the environment. Uh, it's focalized. And so consciousness in the human being is only focalized, just like the glance, or like, as I say, the lens of camera, and consequently limits experience, mm -hmm. but makes it realistic and feasible and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But however, consciousness can be modulated uh, uh, just like the glance, for example, can be modulated from reading the letters in the book or then looking to wide perspective. And this, you can do the same thing with consciousness. So you could m have a narrow vantage point, which is the way most consciousness acts in most people, functions in most people, or then you could have a broad uh, view of things. Mm -hmm. Consciousness becomes really absolutely cosmic. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it will give you a kind of oceanic feeling of... Uh, greatness, of uh, immensity, and so on. And I think we need that. We uh, Psychologically, we suffer from suffocation in walking the cities of New York. You need mm. the wide spaces of the Himalayas. Mm. <coughs> you see, um, now that's one modulation of consciousness, and there are many others. There's a way of turning within, 
uh, which is a little bit difficult to explain, but um, uh, from the moment that you realize that things are not the way they seem, then you feel kind of hemmed in by the way things appear, like the physical world and so on, or your assessment of situations, and then you want to, uh, you feel that there must be something behind this, that there must, you have a hunch that this is just one way of looking at things, there must be another way of looking at things. And that is what makes the rishis and the Himalayas or the dervishes want to leave their worldly life and try to have a totally different experience, the experience of the contemplative. And uh, the consequence is that, um, uh, curiously enough, consciousness can really definitely turn within and then you see the whole thing as it were, as if you were looking outside from within. It's, it's a very strange experience. You, there's no way of describing it, really, unless you do it. You do it. <clears throat> it's like, for example, seeing how, for example, you're swimming on the surface of the lake, lake and you see water lilies, and then you plunge under the water, and then you see that it's all a network of roots, and at the surface it looked like water lilies. Mm -hmm. But now you see the water lilies at the top as separate entities. They look like separate entities at the top, but underneath you see that it's all one. And so in that state, you get back into the roots of your being, uh, which uh, are so much part of all things that they're inextricably uh, intermeshed with all things. And uh, now, um, you see, we, uh, let us say that we're like a pyramid, so that at one end of the pyramid we're an individual being, and at the other end we're part of all things, you see. And normally we function right at the top, and we don't realize that we're part of all things. But there's a way of withdrawing our consciousness from our personal center. And you know, that's what happens to the plants and the trees in the winter. The energy is withdrawn from the surface and drawn back into the roots. I'd like to ask you that uh, I know that uh, fundamentally all the Sufis, they believe the, the direct communion with God without anyone in the middle. Yes. And uh, Well, that's Islam. That that's a particularly Islam, Islam. yes. Um, no priesthood, no monkhood, um, no intercession. intercession. Mm -hmm. Now, they got around it with the Mushids and the Sufis who are never totally gurus, but still, you know, there's a difference between a guru and a Mushid because um, Jalaluddin Rumi, the great Sufi uh, poet, uh, said uh, the Mushid is the destroyer of the idol that his pupils make of him. Is saying it very well, you mm -hmm. see, because in mm -hmm. Islam, of course, um, there's no hierarchy. One person better than another, the, the Islam doesn't recognize that. Oh, no in the Sufism, I found that uh, there are several orders of uh, like Kishti order and yes. uh, Rumi's mm -hmm. yes. and things. And exactly can you tell us that what makes the Kishti order different from the yeah. others? Yeah. Well, the Kishti order originated in um, Afghanistan, as a matter of fact. Uh, Hajramundian Kishti was the first in that line of uh, Kishti Sufis who came to India. In fact, he was the first Sufi who came to, who brought Sufism to India. Uh, well, one might say that Data Ganj was before him, but he didn't really bring, let's say, the message of Sufism on a wide scale. <coughs> My father was the first Sufi to bring Sufism to the West, West. in 1910. Now, Hajar Bani Chishti, uh, I suppose in his contact with the Hindus, he learned something about the Hindus, which uh, I'm sure that the Muslims in Afghanistan in his days didn't know. Uh, they, they used to think that the Hindus were heathens and believed in all kinds of gods and things like that. And uh, so, um, the consequence was a kind of osmosis between Islam and Hinduism, uh, which culminated on, in Akbar's uh, uh, vision of the unity of religions, which was, um, as you know, very early, uh, a very early attempt at, uh, he was, in fact, he found the first congress of religions yeah. mm -hmm. at Fatipur Sikri. <coughs> Uh, but it was short-lived. There was a reaction of Aurangzeb, who um, actually um, killed his brother and took his place, um, and, um, you know, <coughs> Darashiku, and, um, and uh, then there was a persecution of the Sufis uh, by the Orthodoxy of Islam, and uh, so on. Uh, the Sufis, I've 
realize more as time goes on, I realize that the Sufis, what the Sufis are, they are heretics. So um, I consider uh, it a privilege. Other than this uh, historical uh, differences, is there any fundamental philosophical difference between the sect of Kishtis and the other Sufis? Yes, that's the question you asked me. Yes. The Chishti Sufis, I would say, are therefore much broader because they've been in contact with the Hindus. Um, as I said before, one does not have to be a Muslim to be initiated as Sufi, as um, in the Chishti order, whereas, for example, the Qadri or the Naqshbandi, I suppose, uh, people, if I understand well, I, I'm open to correction, but I think that uh, that one would be required to become a Muslim before. And you see a number of these um, Chishti sheikhs, uh, I mean the Sufi sheikhs, coming over to America and converting people to Islam by, uh, as a condition to being initiated in the Sufi order. No such thing with us at all, of course, absolutely universal. And uh, do you have any uh, connections with the Quran as a holy scripture, and uh, do you take it in that way? Or, uh, uh, well, it's one of the scriptures. Um, we uh, have uh, what we call a universal worship, which is a form of um, worship in which we read the texts of all different religions, just like Gandhi did, as a matter of fact. Really? And c the Quran is one of them. Hmm. But and we the read Bible from the Upanishads, the Bible, the Old Testament, oh. the New Testament, Zoroastrianism. Yeah? That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd, I'd like to ask you just for the end of it uh, that uh, is the Sufi path. I know it's a very tricky question, but uh, is it a devotional path or an intellectual path? You see, I tend to be a little bit intellectual, so I might <laughs> give a certain bias to the whole thing. But of course, there's like the bhakti and the jnana in, Sufi, in Hinduism, so there's uh, the, those who are more devotional. And um, then, of course, within the message of Hazrat Nath Khan, the prayers that he gave that are absolutely universal. For example, uh, the second prayer, we recognize thee in all thy holy names as form in, and forms, as Rama, as Krishna, as Shiva, as Buddha. Let us know there's Abraham, as Solomon, as Moses, as Jesus, as Muhammad. So mentions all the prophets in the same prayer. You see, so that's uh, more the devotion aspect. <clears throat> there's no doubt that the two meet because uh, there are moments in one's meditation that there's a, one develops a sense of the divine presence, divine presence. And sacredness. And, uh, so the Sufis uh, believe in a common, very basic beliefs of all religions, and uh, they, with their open heart, they accept the, all the good practices. Yes, that's the by way all to put them. it. And you see, there's no credo, like we, you don't have to mm. believe this or that, mm. and so, and at least in the Sufi order that I represent. So it's very nice. Thank you for being with us yes, today. Thank you very much. And uh, we are so Welcome enjoyed. Enjoyed. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, people at Yakan, for being with us. It was really interesting. <laughs> thank you. Today, Pierre Velayat Inayat Khan, he will be talking to us about the teachings of Sufism. And uh, it's originated from Kaja Moedin Kisti from India, after whom the Kisti order of the Sufism is founded. And Kaja Moedin Kisti was the spiritual advisor to the great emperor Akbar and who was famous for his tolerance towards other religions and philosophies in India during that time. 
one of the teach teachers in the path of Kaja Mohideen Kistis. Abu Hashim Bandani was the teacher of Hazrat Inayat Khan. And he has this disciple, Hazrat Inayat Khan, to go to West and spread the message of Sufism to the people. And in 1910, Hazrat Inayat Khan came to West and he was teaching till 1927. Yeah. And today we have Pierre Alayat Inayat Khan, who is the head of the Sufi order, and he is also the son of Hazrat Inayat Khan. And we are so grateful to him for being with us today in our great visions. And so we'll be starting our topic. Uh, Pierre, could you tell us exactly what Sufism is by giving a small definition? <coughs> well, I suppose <coughs> Sufism is the most undefinable of all isms. <coughs> uh, so it would be very difficult to put in a few words. I suppose one might say that it is a um, spiritual tradition that um, has um, grown, developed, unfurled across the ages and incorporated many other spiritual traditions, so it's very eclectic. <coughs> um, uh, developed under the aegis of Islam, but I think its origin is uh, way back, uh, much earlier than uh, the inception of Islam. Um, I think, personally, and I think uh, quite a number of scholars believe that um, uh, this tradition did originate in the um, tradition of the Magi, uh, that is like the three wise men. Mm -hmm. uh, Magi, the Iranian Magi. <coughs> um, one of the reasons for that is because um, the Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, received the visit in the, de uh, in the desert of um, Mm, uh, Magus, I think one says Magus, one of the religious, um, how can I say, um, <coughs> hierophants of the um, uh, Zoroastrian tradition. Uh, his name was Salman Fassi, and uh, he was sent by the council of the Zoroastrians to meet the prophet in the desert and reveal to him the esoteric meaning of the, uh, the messages that he was receiving. Uh, from Archangel um, Gabriel. <coughs> uh, the fact is, of course, that, um, as you know, the Prophet himself was uh, illiterate, um, and the Zoroastrians had, of course, very advanced uh, civilization and so on. But um, the Prophet was speaking from whatever the voice was coming to, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> Salman Pak was eventually, um, uh, uh, well, actually he was taken prisoner in the um, in the desert, and then eventually he was freed by uh, the, um, uh, the the prophet paid a ransom in order to free him from his um, the people who had made him into a slave, and um, eventually he incorporated him in his, his family. And according to the Mubahala, that is a um, book which you can you you can, uh, you can find in the libraries, um, the prophet was initiated by. Salman Farsi, Salman Pak, in the esoteric tradition, let's say. I would say the universal esoteric tradition that ran through Iran and that must have originated possibly in Egypt, or do we know? There, all of these different traditions were, there was very much osmosis between the different traditions. <coughs> and so uh, the Prophet Muhammad asked um, um, his um, son-in-law, Hazrat Ali to, um, um, how can I say, organize this uh, kind of esoteric uh, group within Islam that was, uh, as I say, much more universal than Islam itself. <clears throat> and they were called Al Al Safa, that means the people of the Sufa. Mm -hmm. And it's possible the word uh, Sufi does originate from that term, Sufa, Sofa. the people of the Sufa. Mm -hmm. There are other etymologies to the words, but um, I don't want to go into it too much. And <coughs> can you tell us that uh, the Sufism, in Sufism, uh, the, about the concept of the ultimate, or God, or Allah, which is the supreme being, the concept of that being, from the standpoint of Sufism? Yes. Well, you see, there are many different viewpoints in Sufism, which I would say are complementary. 
on the whole, one might say that Sufism tends to be pantheistic, and that is uh, very much like Advaita in Hinduism. They believe in the oneness of all things. In fact, uh, the zikr, la ilaha illallah, which is the fundamental uh, affirmation of Islam, is uh, means, really speaking, means it is all one being. And from the moment that you affirm that, then you don't think of God as other than uh, the human being or than the universe. You think it's all one being, you see. And consequently, um, <clears throat> Uh, you will find in Sufism a tendency to say that uh, we are the being of God. And uh, in fact, there was a saying of a uh, dervish, uh, an Egyptian dervish called uh, Abdel Jabbar Nefari, who said, why do, are you looking for God up there? He's here. <clears throat> and uh, I would say that perhaps the essence of the metaphysics of the Sufis is um, instead of looking at God as the object of one's knowledge, looking at God as a subject who knows, you who see. Knows. It's really lo reversing things totally. It's a totally different way of looking at things. <clears throat> when, when you say one, when you speak of one, can you describe a little bit more when you mean we all are one? We are uh, well, one yes. Uh, I should um, define this a little more clearly and say that we're really talking about unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. um, you see, uh, you can understand that um, there's a difference between reconciling divine transcendence and divine immanence, because uh, if it's all one being, if it's all God, if we are the being of God, then of course that means that God is subject to transiency, um, subject to uh, sin, uh, yeah. and all that, you see? <clears throat> Mortal, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, if you posit God as other than ourselves, then you have this, uh, you know, it's a word of... Um, Actually, if I may quote it's a Jewish philosopher, <coughs> um, Sholem, who said, who spoke about the exaggerated sense of otherness that you find in all orthodox as, um, orthodoxy in, in the different religions. And mm. that's true in Judaism, it's true in Christianity, and it's true in Islam. You see? Mm. Thinking of God as other than ourselves. Now, if, on the other hand, if you say that we are the being of God, then of course it's a tremendous assumption because, of course, we are fallible and all so on. But um, that is what we, um, I call it, uh, trying to reconcile the irreconcilable, you see. Mm. And um, in fact, um, it takes, uh, one can say that uh, to understand this is beyond our understanding, and therefore, let's say, the thinking of the human being is limited. Uh, and uh, there are moments when one reaches beyond the limits of uh, the uh, ordinary rational thinking, and that, those are, that's what we call mystical experience. Uh, now, would you like to tell us that uh, the human being, as an individual who is living in this world, who is moving, who is born, walking, and who is going to die, and do you mean to say a part of the supreme being is inside him, or he is a part of that supreme being, and how he is related, in yes. what sense well, he is Well, that's a very good is. question. <laughs> Um, as a matter of fact, um, I can quote Ibn Arabi, who was one of the most brilliant uh, metaphysicians amongst the Sufis, who said, God is not only the experiencer or the spectator, let's say, the observer, but he's also that through which he observes. You see? Uh, so let's say uh, they're talking about degrees of godness, let's say. And uh, as I say, it's very difficult to reconcile it, reconcilables. But uh, my father, Hazrat Inayat Khan, made that very clear when he said, uh, it's like a drop in the sea. We could say that the drop in the sea has uh, all the qualities of, uh, the, of the whole sea. You know, it's a, but uh, still it's a drop in comparison <laughs> to the sea. There's another thought which is very helpful, and that's the one of Dr. David Bohm, who's a um, physicist in London, one of the, I would say, the most eminent physicists of our time, who said the physical universe is a ripple in the ocean of reality. Uh, and so uh, we could say that uh, we could, uh, perhaps it's too much to say that we're the being of God, but let's say we're just like a ripple in that ocean. That, uh, that's a very nice way of looking at it. But uh, there's an interesting point in science today, parallel in science, and that is that every cell, for example, of the human being carries the DNA of the whole body, and in that DNA, of course, there's 
something of the traces of the uh, DNA of the whole universe. So that in fact, let's say, potentially the totality is present in every, how can I say, relative fraction of the totality. That's what we can say. How does Sufism relate to other religions? <clears throat> Well, for one thing, I don't consider Sufism as a religion, but as I say, more like an aesthetic tradition. I'm uh, sorry, more like what? A, an esoteric tradition. I see. Now, it, or an aesthetic school, if you like. Mm -hmm. For example, in India today, uh, you'll find, uh, for example, in Ajmer, which is the center of the Chishti Sufis, <clears throat> to which we belong, you'll find that there are quite a number of um, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, who uh, become initiated in Sufi orders, not just in Ajmer, but throughout India. Now, this is unthinkable. In, in uh, North Africa, for example, you'd have to be a Muslim to be a Sufi, or in most of the Middle East countries, whereas in India you will find, the, and even in Pakistan, curiously enough, which is predominantly Muslim, but um, the um, <coughs> what they call the Sindhi Sufis, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, as uh, disciples, most of them are Hindus. Uh, so that, uh, as I say, the uh, Sufism is very universal, and this view, you will find this view, um, of course, very highly uh, developed in my father's uh, message of unity, but um, you will find it in, for example, the teaching of um, Al-Halaj, you'll find it in the teaching of Ibn Arabi, you'll find it in the teaching of uh, uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, for example, Jalaluddin Rumi said, I am um, not a Muslim, I'm not a Jew, I'm not a Christian, and I'm not a Hindu. Uh, and then I, he said, I'm not a Gabar, which means a, a, a Zoroastrian, because I belong to the religion of love. Uh, now, I think that a lot of Sufis would say, I am a Muslim, and I am a Christian, and I am a Jew and a Hindu because I belong to the religion of love. <clears throat> and then I know that a lot of, uh, I've said that in public, and um, then of course I'm open to accusation, like how can you be a uh, Muslim if, you, if you're a Christian? If you're a Christian, you believe that God is, uh, Christ is God, and if you're a Muslim, you don't believe that God doesn't have a son, so how can you reconcile these two? <clears throat> there we get right into the crunch. <clears throat> how do you? <laughs> well, <clears throat> Um, I like to think of a uh, word of my father who said, um, of, well, uh, quoting Christ, who said, uh, be perfect as your father is perfect. <clears throat> so he meant that um, we all have within us the divine inheritance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only difference is that um, Christ was aware of his inheritance, so he could claim it. And if you're not aware of your divine inheritance, you can't claim it. I think that was putting it in a very nice way. Well, what are, what are the, some of the practices? Uh, meditation, prayer, uh, what are some of the Sufi practices? Uh, or yes. Well, of course, we have many practices, but I would say the accent is on working with the personality in order to manifest or, let's say, to unfurl those uh, potentialities which one might consider to be the divine... Uh, the divine inheritance, <clears throat> so that uh, we work, uh, we give people uh, mantrams, for example, uh, which are, mm, well, I suppose that the, the very sound of the mantram has some value, you know. Uh, Is that repeating? Uh, repeating a certain word, you see. Now, um, th I think the reason why the sound has some value is because um, these uh, mantrams originate in, um, we call it wazifa, the Sufis call it wazifa, it's the same word, as, uh, same as what the Hindus mean by mantram. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why I think they have a value is because the, um, they originate in, um, uh, let's say, archaic languages, uh, which have not, uh, which have, have not uh, been distorted by, let's say, convention. Let's mm -hmm. say, uh, for example, we agree that the word table means this object here, you see. But that's a convention. Whereas uh, there are certain words which mean, w where the sound corresponds to what they mean. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you an example, for example, <coughs> of some of the mantras of the Sufis, if you'd like. Yes. Yes? I would, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
for example ya ka So it's obviously the divine power coming through you, or discovering, as my father says, discovering in yourself the very same power that moves the universe. So it's kind of discovering something that is in you, is part of your inheritance, but uh, you have to earmark it in yourself, otherwise it doesn't become a reality in your being. Another word is kudus, kudus, pure spirit. You see the difference. Another word, um, just like water flowing, uh, in order to give you, um, let's say, to let's say the outpouring of the divine bounty in your being, so that it may become manifest as a reality in your personality. <coughs> and is it true the more you repeat? The more the power and stuff. Well, yes. Uh, the, as I say, the word has um, some effect upon uh, the different centers of the body. Imagine that you concentrate on the, I don't know whether you're familiar with the word chakra, the center, the, for example, the heart center, which is a plexus, the cardiac plexus, a plexus from the point of view of physiology. And now you're bombarding the cells of that uh, plexus with sound. Well, what happens if you bombard a tray of uh, sand, for example, with sound? The mm -hmm. sand is going to espouse certain structure. The surface mm -hmm. of the sand is going to take up certain forms. <clears throat> so that's what you're doing to your body. But quite apart from that, I think that the sound acts as a kind of Pavlov signal, let's say. You know, and the Pavlov reflex, perhaps you know what I'm talking about, the Pavlov reflex. Well, uh, they were experimenting with uh, dogs, um, giving them uh, salivation. Uh, they would ring a bell uh, when they gave them food, and eventually, uh, even if they didn't give them food, as soon as they heard the bell, right. they would salivate. 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 So the same thing here. For example, if you're, uh, we're trying to sow the seed of a, of a quality uh, in the soil of a person, I'm speaking metaphorically because, really speaking, those qualities are already present. Mm. But still, by um, this means, I think that one is really using a kind of form of auto-suggestion, really mm -hmm. one is uh, the un one is feeding the unconscious with a g seed thought, let's say, which eventually develops and uh, becomes then uh, very positive. There's no doubt that that's what no, people... No, from the time a disciple comes to the master mm -hmm. yeah. and he starts his chanting of the mantras or uh, uh, this sacred words given by the master yeah. and uh, till he reaches the goal or the absolute are there many stages of yes. uh, going through that yes for example we do have several initiations in the Sufi order now we uh, have some problem with the um, whole ego trip that is involved when you you have a higher rank than me, and what you have that I don't have, you know, that kind of thing, which is uh, developed in our time, a kind of democracy. So um, we don't like to make too much about the initiations, but there's no doubt about it that one goes through different stages in one's life. Uh, one could say that everyone is in life according to their degree of realization. Uh, uh, now, whatever that means, I mean, one, it, if you, as soon as you make a system out of it, then of course, you distort the whole thing, but um, it, it must correspond to a reality. And uh, what is the actual experience of God? What is that? How one achieves that? Well, <clears throat> as I say, well, maybe I could quote one of the Sufis, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Ansari, who was um, in, an Afghan Sufi. His tomb is in Herat in Afghanistan. And he said, I was looking for God, and all that I found was myself. And then I looked for myself, and I found God. Mm -hmm. Now that is really the answer. Like, uh, like, where are you going to find God if it's not, you know, in the human being? <clears throat> so um, instead of thinking of God as other than oneself, one realizes that um, God is coming through, is manifesting and actuating himself, uh, but. It is our notion of ourselves as sands in the way of this, of the bounty of this being coming through. In fact, my father said this, I think, in the best way that I've ever come across, 
when he said, um, we think that we are a plant, but in fact, of course, the plant is the unfurling of a seed, but you can't see the seed in the plant. But at the end of the process, the seed does re-emerge in the heart of the flower, so that the divinity of our being is continually trying to come through. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt about it that we are that being, but of course, uh, limited by the... Um, by our own sense of ourselves, as a matter of fact. Our own so sense it's of a recognition by the aspirant that he has reached it or he has seen it, he has experienced God, it is his own yeah. understanding. Yeah. It's a, an experience that, it's a kind of realization that can dawn upon a person. Now, um, in this respect, I must say that, again, I, this is by, my father really makes most of the Sufi teaching really very clear. Uh, there's a difference between two awakenings. He calls it the first awakening is like samadhi. It's something that you experience in meditation um, if you go on the retreat <clears throat> and you, um, as I've done, fasting for 40 days, for example, in a cave and uh, uh, don't see anybody and, uh, you know, you really, what happens to the human mind is extraordinary, of course. And if you pursue the, the, the right practices, then you get to a point when you feel as though you had awakened from the way things look from the ordinary point of view. And then, then you understand the meaning of the Hindu word maya, that it's, uh, it doesn't mean that this is not matter. What it means is that what we think the physical world is, is not what it is. What it and is. that any physicist nowadays will tell you the same thing, of course. The, phys the world is not the way it looks. But um, then what is more is that you realize that you are not what you think you are. <laughs> mm. uh, so your self-image is totally blown, <clears throat> and you have a sense of awakening beyond existence. Of course, if you go far enough, then you, uh, you realize that you had been, you're like the, um, uh, the denizen from outer space who had landed on the planet and thought he was a person mm. and had forgotten what he was, you mm. see. And uh, now you are beginning to remember who you are, and you realize that you were caught in just a vantage point. Mm -hmm. So that would be so. At that, in that state, let's say the physical, the way the physical world looks, since it's illusory, it doesn't impress you. So it could be there. It couldn't. It didn't have to be there. It doesn't matter, you know. Uh, and so one has awakened out of life. Now, there's another awakening that my father is talking about, and, that's way, and that is the way of the Sufis, and that's the awakening in life. And uh, that, of course, is, um, you know, in Samadhi, as I say, you, you're not aware of the physical world. But in this awakening, you're right in the middle of things. And uh, now the secret of this is to be found, again, in the words of Ibn Arabi, uh, there are two things, you see. What, on one hand, one discovers that one is the divine glance looking into the universe. Instead of thinking, I am the eyes through which God sees, my glance is the divine glance. Glance. And the second one is that what I think is my personality is the divine nature that has been distorted, disfigured, uh, constrained, limited, and so on, but still is the divine nature. So fundamentally, it's a change in thinking and change in understanding.
for the one. Today we're very honored and privileged to have with us a very special guest, Pir Vilayat Inayat Khan. He is the head of the Sufi Order of the West. And just as a point of clarification, the West indicates Europe and what we would consider the Western world. Welcome, Pir Vilayat. Thank you, Tasneem. We are offering a series of programs on spirituality in everyday life. But many of our viewers have very little familiarity with Su Sufism or the Sufi order. Could you just give us a little bit of background on what is Sufism, what is the Sufi order? Well, it is the most uh, undefinable of all isms. I look at it as a river that has a lot of affluence and um, um, many different traditions have come together in the, in the Sufi order. And um, essentially, the way that I see it now, we are working for unity, and especially for a rapprochement between different religions. And I think that's very important for the sake of peace in the world today. So it's conciliatory, in a way, yes, to... Yes, uh, we might say networking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you define it as a religion? Is this... No, no, it's definitely not a religion, no. Um, I think of the order as an... An initiatic order, that is, uh, one is initiated into the order, um, and uh, the order itself serves a purpose beyond the order. What, would you say, what is that purpose? Uh, that purpose is, um, well, for one thing, to work for um, unity uh, in diversity, mm -hmm. uh, try to bring about a rapprochement in different religions. For example, you organize congresses of religions and uh, well, we had a pageant in which all the different religions were represented, and we have a universal worship, a form of worship in which uh, one might call it an interfaith service in which we read the texts of different religions so that we're proving and we're showing uh, where there are similarities between the different religions. We're proving that fundamentally there's, uh, there is unity behind that diversity. Mm. Well, in our time, it's, it's certainly a message that people are ready to hear. And it's it's innovative, and yet, how do you how do you approach, say, the Muslim or the Jew, uh, the Christian, the Protestant, and ask them to participate? Do you, in fact, ask them to be part of this Congress? Yes. Oh, yes. Of course, we invite uh, uh, rabbis and uh, bhikkhus and swamis and imams of different and of course Catholic priests and also Protestant and Orthodox priests to uh, come and uh, share the platform. And uh, mm -hmm. not only do they give talks, but they also exchange views. And sometimes, of course, the friendship between them is, uh, is very, very endearing. It's lovely to see uh, the Muslim and the Jew, for example, um, uh, uh, establishing a very deep friendship and, and uh, really understanding each other very deeply at a, uh, let's say, communing at a, at mm -hmm. a soul level. It's very heartening because uh, it looks as though these are these religions are in conflict. Right, mm. right. Traditionally, they stand apart or are... Uh, well, it looks as though they would. Well, that's just politics. Mm. True. Mm. We were wondering, uh, in listening to some of the views that, that you share on uh, meditation, can you tell us something about uh, this idea of the broken heart, uh, the broken heart of God? Yes, well, you see, um, if we look at things from a personal angle, each person is a different person, an individual. Mm -hmm. That's the way things look from the personal vantage point. Now, if we were to look at things from an overall vantage point, then we would realize the unity behind uh, many, the many different people, and we'd realize, for example, that what we mean by God is the collective being. And um, our hearts are then, in some way, fragments of the heart of that collective being, which we call God. And uh, consequently, when we suffer, uh, we feel that, um, in some way, the whole of the universe suffers with us, exactly like, for example, if a leaf of a tree um, is uh, not uh, well, the whole rest of the tree suffers. Or if uh, one of the cells of our body is in pain, the whole body feels pain. So if um, mm -hmm. one human being uh, is dying of hunger, as it is the case in many places in the world, or is in despair, or is suffering from terrible uh, dying of cancer, or so on, mm -hmm. the whole 
there, there is a, if one is at all aware, uh, one is, uh, one experiences a feeling of solidarity with the suffering of other beings. Mm. And one feels like doing something about it, ah. if one can. That prompts my next question, which is, is it akin to the philosophy of the Bodhisattva, who... And, uh, well, as, as already said, Sufism does, as far as possible, work for the rapprochement of different religions. On the other hand, we must admit that each religion has a different approach, mm -hmm. and the compassion of the Bodhisattva is uh, more like uh, finding a solution uh, from suffering by uh, detachment and being without desire, mm. whereas uh, in the what they call the monistic religions, I mean the um, the um, revealed religions like uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, the accent is uh, much more on involving oneself in life and suffering, and uh, trying to transmute suffering into joy. So I've heard the phrase that. The Sufi is one who is in the world, but not of it. Well, that's a word of Christ, of course. Uh, but uh, that, uh, of course, um, you know, the early Sufis were uh, considered as uh, not being quite within the the religion because of Islam, because they they were following the path of poverty, for example, and the path of um, of um, self sacrifice and the path of the saint. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, according to Islam, of course, that is what um, uh, what Christianity is about, um, to be in the world and not of the world. But this thread of wisdom from whenever it began, yeah. uh, coming now into this present time, how does this concern for humanity, uh, the, the awakened sense of compassion, operate uh, in the Sufi order? <laughs> well, <clears throat> we are definitely trying to meet human problems instead of finding a way uh, to escape from human problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, trying to apply some of the age-old methods of uh, meditation in order to help people to deal with problems. Uh, and therefore, I think it is very relevant to psychology, for example. Mm -hmm. um, for example, to deal with resentment, um, which is a terrible have, plague. Yes. Uh, you know, the consultation rooms of um, psychologists are absolutely filled with people who suffer from um, terrible resentment, from a grievance. They uh, may have suffered from terrible trauma in their childhood or in their youth, or even today they might have been very badly uh, handled by somebody, and um, it's very difficult for them to overcome their anger and their hatred. Um, now, uh, imagine that Christ uh, were to knock at your door today, or anybody's door today, my door today, um, perhaps he comes from. Perhaps he comes from a concentration camp. Perhaps he mm. has just uh, tried. He was caught. Uh, he was taken to in the concentration camp because he was trying to to free prisoners from a concentration camp. And here he is, uh, covered with blood, and knocking at your door mm. with all the grandeur and greatness of his being. What would he say? He would say, I, th I imagine he would say, I beg you, overcome your resentment. Do you realize that um, these uh, the, um, resentments are people individually built up in, build up into wars? You're afraid of a war. It starts with you. Now, um, I say that to people very often. But um, very often people say, Pierre Vallat, you're asking too much. Uh, this person has ruined my life. How do you expect mm -hmm. me to overcome my resentment, my anger toward that person? Um, and. Uh, my answer is that if you would get into the consciousness of the person who harmed you, and that is a method of meditation, you see, to mm. turn within and transfer one's consciousness into the consciousness of the person, uh, then you would realize from what place that action took place, um, how they felt, how they were perhaps uh, struggling for self-esteem, and you were the victim of their struggle for self-esteem. So I don't say that you will condone their action, but mm -hmm. you uh, will um, understand it. And I think understanding is 99% of, um, 
of forgiving. Some people would approach the problem of resentment through prayer, for instance. Pray for uh, the, the freeing up of their heart so that they could forgive someone uh, or pray for that understanding. What would you describe as, as the difference, if you see a difference, between, you mentioned meditation, between meditation and prayer as approaches? Yes, I think that uh, meditation and prayer are two aspects of the same thing, except that uh, the modern interpretation of meditation is often something like stress reduction or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. which gets a little bit too far from its original uh, place. Uh, meditation is really part of the religious um, uh, 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 attunement, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the communication with God as the reality of which we are uh, part. Something intrigued me about uh, you're referring to Christ in the present tense. What if he came now and knocked at the door? Yes. Uh, does this indicate that that you form a, a, a living image? Uh, yes, you see, we always think of the masters as uh, we um, project uh, pictures of the masters as they were described in the Bible or in mm -hmm. the Quran or whatever, or the Hindu scriptures. Uh, so we think of them in the past. Right. Um, but um, I, I think that there is a dimension of every being, not only that of the masters, every being, that is absolutely unchanged throughout time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, a part of it's just like a pendulum. Part of our being is moving time, and part of our being is is mm -hmm. uh, totally um, eternal. And uh, so, I, when I think of Christ, I don't think of uh, Jesus having existed at some time of history, but as a being who is permanently present in the hearts of um, every being. And I think of the same the same way of Buddha and of. Um, um, uh, of Rama, for example, or Shiva, or of Abraham, mm. and Moses, and um, and Muhammad, and many uh, Pythagoras, and uh, Echnaton, and all, uh, a lot, not just what we call the prophets, but maybe what one might call uh, extent, more extensively the masters. I once heard you say that uh, in referring to the experience that a person has in, in living their life, and maybe they come to a point of examination and they wonder, well, what has this all been for? You know? mm -hmm. uh, and I heard you respond to the, the positing of that question by saying that there's an accumulation of experience and that this somehow creates a, a more vast total experience that, that is that what is resurrected? Well, the way I see it is that um, I suppose one could describe ourselves as for example, water lilies in a pond, so that at the surface we look like separate beings, and in the depth there's just one network of roots. Mm -hmm. And so the experience of each being accrues to the consciousness of the whole. That's what I was mm -hmm. getting at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's probably what we mean by resurrection, that somehow um, what is experienced can never get lost. I mean, what is acquired can never get lost because it just wouldn't make sense. I mean. Um, uh, when you look at the program of the universe, everything is so intelligently devised, uh, so it doesn't, wouldn't make sense if uh, the experience of a lifetime gets lost. One could say it's, I suppose, like throwing the perfume out of uh, flowers, and maybe the flowers fade away, but that perfume is going, the flowers are going to continue to live eternally as perfume. And perfume is sometimes called essence. Yes. Right. Yeah, it's a word that's used by the Sufis, the mm. essence. And um, it is true that as one uh, gets uh, a little older, I suppose, and um, is closer to death, one tends to um, prune one's being, and um, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, one becomes more and more like an essence. Mm. One identifies more and more with the essence of one's being. You spoke about meeting the needs of, of humanity, those that are suffering. We traditionally think of, of healing as uh, a function of the doctor, but there are also what we might call metaphysicians. Uh, do you have any work that directly addresses uh, healing? Well, of course. Um, I think we're working very close to 
psychotherapy to what um, psychologists are doing. Mm. Um, we uh, two days ago, or yesterday, as a matter of fact, we had a confrontation between uh, Sufis and um, psychotherapists, and it was very interesting to see how we were dealing with the same question with uh, complementary approaches, uh, mm -hmm. uh, different approaches. Both of them are uh, very important. On one hand, we find that uh, you know spiritualists are accused of what they call the spiritual bypass, which is not dealing with human problems, making people high, and uh, finally uh, they are uh, they become otherworldly and um, uh, not really in the here and now, mm -hmm. um, or able to uh, meet their commitments and so on and so forth. It's a kind of uh, cop out, you see. <clears throat> on the other hand, I think that uh, one uh, there is also a danger for psychologists to neglect the need of the human being for what one might call the spiritual dimension. And uh, I know it's difficult to define, but um, somehow it is a sense of something beyond oneself that lures one into uh, say, improving oneself. Uh, I'm putting it rather simplistically. One might say that the whole evolutionary drive of humanity is lured by a kind of intuition that we have of uh, uh, a reality of which we are simply the expression, but a, a reality that is sublime, let's say. Mm. And um, uh, let us say, uh, we could, uh, one could express that as our need for beauty and also our need for understanding beyond the mind. Uh, and um, if people uh, are not given opportunity to uh, give expression to that need, uh, they become disenchanted. And uh, I think that many of the psychological disorders that we find are to be found amongst people who have lost their faith in the meaningfulness of life. They become disenchanted and become self-denigrating -de uh, and eventually self-defeating. I hear the glimmer of, more than the glimmer, uh, hope. Uh, again, for our viewers, since we want to bring some aspects of spirituality into everyday life, yes, uh, yes. this idea of moving forward toward uh, an ideal or, or a goal, does that, is that what draws a person to <coughs> let's say, uh, leave behind past hurtful memories, things yes. know, that have held them back. Yes, well, I can uh, give you the example of uh, my own personal case where I suffered um, terrible um, uh, psychological trauma because of the, uh, the, uh, an accident um, where my fiancé was killed when I was very young. And uh, I cured myself by... Um, playing every night the whole B minor mass. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that um, this would be a cure for everybody, but it did certainly uh, cure me. And I think the reason was because um, I found that it brought me into what I would like to call the emotion of the soul instead of the emotion of the heart. Mm -hmm. And I felt ashamed of uh, wallowing in what uh, the English call my storms in my teacups when I was missing the cosmic celebration in the heavens. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that is just an uh, indication of what religion must mean to a lot of people. Um, and perhaps they don't know exactly uh, why it means what it does to them. But they do have an intuition of uh, a need for something beyond the humdrum, yes. commonplace, everyday reality. Yes. And, uh, that, uh, and since it does... Um, play a part in um, dealing with human problems, I think that um, it's, it's necessary to, um, to uh, do something about it. And I think that where this need of a human being is not satisfied, a person starts to become rather, as I say, disenchanted. And mm -hmm. um, uh, um, there's a kind of desecration which leads eventually towards violence. The meaningfulness of life is gone. Yes, oh. yes. Mm. Uh, there are other aspects of the Sufi order which uh, I suppose address different areas of need in society. The activity of the brotherhood, sisterhood work, mm. 
Uh, you mentioned also Zirat as an aspect of the work of the Sufi order. Would yeah. you like to comment on either of those? Or Yes. Well, as I said, um, I feel that uh, the work that we're doing in meditation is just uh, like training ourselves uh, to uh, work with our uh, consciousness, even to work with our conscience, mm -hmm. um, in order to become more aware and to reach out beyond our limited point of view so that we are able to get into the hearts of all beings and experience what it's like to be other beings. Um, it must um, result in actual work being done right. Right. to help people. Uh, for example, uh, one of our members is, um, ha is organizing food banks, for example. That means he's getting uh, firms that would normally be throwing their food away to uh, give the food uh, that will then be distributed to people who are dying of hunger. You'd be surprised that a lot of people are dying of hunger in the in United America. States. Yes. He's taking people off the roads and giving them shelter, for example. Now, that's one of the activities that has uh, developed out of uh, the Brotherhood act and Sisterhood activity of the Sufi order. Um, in India, we have a welfare center giving uh, milk to lots of children every day. I think it's now it started with 300, now it's, I think it's something like 500 children every day who would never become proper adults unless they got uh, those vitamins that you, right. um, yeah, uh, otherwise it'd just be fed on rice. And as a matter of fact, many of them have, are starving. They don't have anything to eat at all. Mm -hmm. and they're just dying of hunger. Uh, some of them are living in, um, uh, uh, actually they tie little bits of string from one uh, m one tomb to the other and place little bits of cardboard and uh, and cloth uh, between these and that's their home and um, the mothers have to drag their babies in the mud uh, to the faucets which and and queue up for uh, sometimes uh, hours to have uh, five minutes uh, to be able to wash their babies and then they mm -hmm. drag them back in the mud again that's a kind of uh, thing that we are dealing with and uh, where we have a school and for children, uh, uh, teaching them uh, something practical instead of the kind of uh, useless thing that <laughs> children mm. learn at school, uh, w working with wood or electricity or something Good. so they can sort of um, get a job when they grow up. And also we're working with, um, we have a clinic and uh, we are, uh, sometimes we have 300 or 400 people coming through our clinic every mm. day, some of whom would not have the money to uh, pay for a bus fare to go to the hospital. Amazing. There's so much to be done. I feel to ask you if there were, let's say, a, a wish or a projection, um, an image of what we can do, how we can enhance the experience of, of living, uh, if you would share that with our audience. Yes. Well, basically, <coughs> I... Uh, I, I'm very concerned with um, a word of Dr. Kubler-Ross, who is a psychiatrist who's working with people who are dying, and, said, and she said that when people are about to die, there are two things that they regret the most. One is not having accomplished what they would have liked to accomplish, and the mm -hmm. other is not having become what they would have, what they could have been if they would have been what they might have been. <coughs> and um, so I find that people suffer from a sense of frustration and need to be helped to unfold their being. Uh, it's something very basic that uh, uh, it, it curious people go about their jobs and their families and so on, uh, not realizing how uh, they, um, um, how frustrated they are in their um, sense of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, most people suffer from uh, low a bad self-image and are struggling for self-esteem. Yes. Uh, so we're dealing with, I would say, one of the most widespread problems of humans. Um, and um, so one has to learn how one can work with oneself to unfold the potentialities in one's being. And this is not an easy thing. It's, um, it requires a lot of know-how and um, um, in, in fact, it does also require one to sh change one's uh, very 
fundamental assumptions about oneself and the universe. For example, one thinks of the universe as other than oneself. And it's, um, you know, the new paradigm of our time, what is called the holistic paradigm. Uh, what it says is really is that every fraction of the universe carries within it potentially the totality. So if we were aware of the richness, the bounty of the potentialities within our being, uh, it would help us to manifest them in our personality. And the Sufi order then would help people uh, get in touch with some of that, experientially get in touch with yes. some of that. Well, that's what we're doing now, meditation. Yes. So it's not just uh, stress reduction, mm -hmm. or learning how to relax or breathe and, and so on. That's, of course, very important. Uh, but it goes uh, much more into being creative in one's personality. Uh, and as I say, some of the most basic uh, ways in which we think, which are really not y very mature, need to be uh, revised yes. and updated. Thank you very much. It's, it's been enlightening. And uh, if anyone would like to get in touch with the Sufi order, uh, they can reach you in, uh, in New York at the headquarters in, in New York or contact the local Sufi orders here. Uh, we look forward to having you join us again, uh, again exploring how spirituality can be integrated into everyday life. And until next time, this has been Toward the One.